Soul Surfer. It's a movie that you might have seen based on the true story of Bethany Hamilton. Bethany was born to surf, and in her was seen a natural talent who um, just took to the waves at a very early age. And she was leading an idyllic, sun-drenched surfer girl's life on the coast of Kauai, competing in national competitions when everything changed in a heartbeat. In her early teens, while surfing, she was attacked by a shark and she lost all of her left arm. When she was asking her dad about surfing again, and he said, soon, and then together they used the words from scripture, because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. A month later, Bethany was back on her surfboard, won several championships, and was a professional surfer at 21 years of age. Not only did Bethany receive encouragement from her father when she was discouraged, but words of encouragement came from God too, because words her father used came from God the Father. And in the Bible, in God's Word, we can find many words of encouragement. When discouraged, we might use that same verse, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Or be strong and courageous, do not fear, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will not leave you. Or fear not, for I am with you, I am your God, I will strengthen you, I will help you. Or cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. We find many verses like this in the Bible. Because God knows we need encouragement. A man walks into a diner and asks where the payphone is, and yes, this is in the day of no cell phones. And the waitress points him in the right direction. He puts a quarter in, dials and says, Hello, Mr. Jones, this is Mr. Smith. I'd like to know if you have a place in your organization for a smart hard-working sales manager to oversee your staff. Okay, I see. You already have a smart, hard-working sales manager and you like him very much. Okay, well, thank you for your time, sir. Have a good day. Hangs up the phone, has a big smile on his face, starts whistling, walking to the, towards the door, which really puzzles the waitress who asks, what are you so happy about? You have just been rejected. And he turns and says to her, actually, I didn't get rejected. You see, I am the smart, hardworking sales manager at that company. I just want to make sure my boss thought so too. Now, this is a fictional story, but there's truth behind it. People are starving for compliments, affirmation, and encouragement. The word encourage is used more than a hundred times in the New Testament. One of the great characters of the Bi in the Bible we're going to look at today will speak to us about encouragement, and his name is Barnabas. We meet Barnabas for the first time in Acts 4. Here's how his story starts. Joseph, that was his name in the beginning, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles later called Barnabas, sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Here, Joseph is the first recorded donor in this new community where the text says he put the money at the apostles' feet saying, with it, what he's really saying is, okay, you're going to know best what to do with this money. There are no strings attached. You don't have to build a building with my name on it. Just use it to bless people. And because of the spirit with which this man gave, and because he gave to help and encourage a community that was struggling at the time, the apostles changed his name to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So you get a sense, starting to get a sense of what, the, what kind of man Barnabas was. Anyway, after this, Barnabas disappears for a while, and the next time we see him is in Acts 9, 
when he comes along a man named Saul. And yes, many of you will know Saul, some maybe not. Saul is the one who had terrorized Jesus' followers, persecuted, killed them, until one day on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus, he repented, he trusted Jesus, and now he's a believer. But he's got a problem. He's got a problem because when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join Jesus' disciples. But they were all afraid of him. They could not believe that he was really a disciple. He had murdered their friend Stephen. He threatened, persecuted, imprisoned, and killed their husbands, wives, brothers, and sisters. So how do they know this is for real? And that he's not faking it. Just to get inside and maybe damage, do more damage. Well, they decide to send Barnabas to check this guy out. So he went to meet Saul, came his friend, got to know him. He was inclined to see the best in him. And he went to his brothers and sisters and said, look, look at the change in his life. Look at what happened between him and God. Look at how he is devoting his life to the gospel. Take it from me. This man can be trusted. The disciples then embraced him. Saul stayed with them, moved freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. Let me ask you something. What would, hap what would have happened to Saul had Barnabas not come alongside him? What would have happened? Anyway, after this, Barnabas disappears again for a little while until another critical moment in the history of the church, Acts 11, says some from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also telling the good news about Jesus and the Lord's hand was with them great number of people believed and turned to the Lord so up to this point the good news about Jesus was spreading among the Jewish people but now Gentiles and non-Jews were becoming believers too and so Barnabas was sent to check them out and as it says in the Bible, he, when he arrived, he saw evidence of the grace of God. And he was glad with what he saw, and he encouraged them all to just stay true to the Lord with all their hearts. And in the Bible, it describes Barnabas as being a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord because of him. So this has just given you some more insight into the person of Barnabas. So the church is growing. And as it was, Barnabas is realizing, okay, I'm going to need some help here. I'm going to need somebody to help me deal with this new opportunity. Someone who knows the scriptures, somebody who can speak and teach the Gentiles, somebody who has courage, somebody who has energy, and somebody with a strong mind and a quick tongue. And Saul came to mind. No one had been more Jewish than Saul, no more zeal for the Torah than Saul. And so Barnabas thinks, okay, I think I can use him here. Well, Saul soon became known as Paul. Saul was the Jewish version of his name. Paul is the Greek or Gentile version. Paul would and did become a great missionary to the Gentiles and the rest of the world. His name was appropriate. The name change was right. Paul would change the world, but it only happened because of Barnabas, because Barnabas saw something in him that no one else had. So Barnabas and Paul then did ministry together, and after a whole year of teaching, preaching, and traveling together, Paul is growing as a, as a leader, and his gifts begin to flourish, his maturity is blossoming, and in Acts 14, the names are switched. It's no longer Barnabas and Paul who went to the synagogue, it's Paul and Barnabas who went, 
And Barnabas was okay with that because it's part of who he was as the son of encouragement. So Paul and Barnabas, they would travel often together and they would travel with other believers. They'd need other people to help them get that word out about Jesus. And one of the young men they reached out to and took alongside them was a man by the name of John Mark. And John Mark traveled with them for a while, but then one day, all of a sudden, he left. He just deserted them. And nothing was said, just disappeared. And nobody knows why. So when Paul wanted Barnabas to join him on yet another trip to strengthen the churches, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. He wanted to give him another chance just the way he'd given Paul another chance earlier. But Paul didn't like the idea. He said, no. He deserted us before. I'm not going to take him along. That could happen again. And so they strongly disagreed. They separated ways. Barnabas went his way to still continue to help grow the church, but this he went and he took John Mark with him took him on his travels, and the life of John Mark is one more tribute to the power of Barnabas, the encouraging one, because John Mark is the one who is believed to be the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. So let me ask you this now. What if Barnabas had given up on Mark? You know, although Barnabas never wrote one word of scripture, as far as we know, he was responsible for over half of the New Testament. And think of it this way, the two people he influenced the most were Saul of Tarsus, later known as Paul, and John Mark, and Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. John Mark went on to write the gospel which bears his name, that's 14 out of 27 books. Not a bad record for a man most people would consider a minor Bible character named Barnabas. How we need his kind today. We could use a lot more like him because people need encouragement today. Like Barnabas, we need to be encouragers. The idea is all over the New Testament. Hebrews 3.13 says, Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today. Thessalonians 5.11, Encourage one another and build each other up. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let's not give up meeting together. Let's encourage one another. Ephesians 4.29, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Encouragement is fuel for the soul, and everybody needs it. A kind, encouraging word, whether it's written, whether it's spoken, can be the instrument that God uses to cause us to press on. And scripture does not say, if you have the gift of encouragement, or if you feel like it, it plainly says, encourage one another today. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? And every day, every day we are in a position where we can offer encouragement. Every day there's the opportunity to encourage somebody. And we should never assume that people don't need it. And the reality is, encouragement is a form of love. And everybody wants more of it. When Abraham Lincoln was tragically killed, several items were found in his pockets. An embroidered handkerchief, watch, some money, but most interesting of all was a ragged copy of a newspaper article. 
And the article had been written during a time of great controversy and turmoil in the country. And in the text of the article, the writer extolled Lincoln's virtues, approving decisions that he had made while he was in office. Lincoln was not different from the rest of us. Needed to be appreciated. Cherished the applause when those, from those who observed him. I remember the day, a day when I received a really nice email from somebody, one that left me encouraged. And I let my husband read it, and he said to me, you should keep that. He said, you should put something like that in a file titled encouragement, and I did, and I do. Because like all of us, there are times when I feel discouraged and encouraging words keep me going. We all need a Barnabas. There is no one in this room who doesn't need a Barnabas. We all need somebody to lift our spirits when our soul is broken. We all need someone to awaken the very best in us. And we need somebody to help keep us going forward. So I just want us to start thinking today, who's been your Barnabas? Who has encouraged you along the way? And another question is, who needs you to be a Barnabas to them? Because there's no doubt, there's no doubt that God is ready right now to use you to unleash somebody's creativity and unlock their potential and ready to use you to stir somebody's passions and stretch them beyond past experiences and strengthen them to face their challenges. God is ready to use you. So I'm just wanting us to take a real good, honest look at God's invitation in the scriptures to be generous with our words of encouragement and to ask ourselves, are we ready to see the promise and the people God brings into our life and unlock the doors for them? Because the act of encouragement begins in seeing people as God sees them, for all they can be and for all they're becoming. Young Cameron just got it in his head that he knew how to arrange army men for battle. And this happened during the Iraq war. And the news had obviously affected young Cameron because one day he spent the entire day outside creating intricate formations of little green army men. And when he finished, he insisted his mother take a picture of it just in case she happened to run into an army officer and that way she, he could share his battle plan so the officer would know how to fight the war. Well, as if that would happen, but mom took the picture anyway. And it wasn't long after that, Cameron's mom was invited to a special occasion, celebration. Somebody was turning 100, and one person attending that event was Don Rogers, who was a retired three-star general. And what were the chances, really, of meeting a military strategist at this event? Well, she did take out one of the photos Cameron had insisted she take. She gave it to General Rogers, explaining what Cameron had done. He looked it over, and later he took the time to write Cameron a letter. And in it he said, Cameron, your mom, she shared with me your battle formation plans. I've looked it over. I've studied it. I want you to know that I can see your line of thought. And with your permission, I'd like to share it with my friends at the Pentagon. So we can only imagine. We can only imagine what that did for that little boy's self-esteem. It built him up in a way that nothing else could ever have done, and it came at a time when Cameron badly needed encouragement. Encouragement might take the form of a simple word of affirmation. It might be telling somebody you believe they can succeed. It might even be a letter from a three-star general 
whatever form it takes, let's make a point of discovering how we might give encouragement. Not everybody can be a Paul, but everybody can be a Barnabas. Everybody needs a Barnabas. Everybody needs to be a Barnabas. So again, I ask, who's yours? Who's your Barnabas? And who needs you today? Who needs you to be their Barnabas? Something for us to think about today. Let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for those who have encouraged us. What a sad and dreary world it would be without them. They light the way, they lift us up when we fall down, and many of us would have quit long ago if someone hadn't encouraged us to keep on going, and we celebrate those who do this for us. When we think today about the question, who's our Barnabas? Who's been our encourager, cheerleader, and the one who came to us with the right words at the right time when we needed it most? When we think about them today, we start wondering whether or not we've ever shared with them how much their words have meant to us and changed us. When people live like a Barnabas, lives do change. And there's so much negativity in this world, it becomes easy to give up. But with encouragers, there's that push to believe in ourselves and carry on. So dear God, help us take our, the words in Scripture to heart this morning, because we truly want to be encouragers. We want to be that for you, because you are the one who encourages us to do this. And when we do, we do know, Father, that it's going to boost somebody's faith in you, and that's what we pray for, first and foremost. And it will also strengthen this church, your church here and beyond. So please, open our eyes to see the opportunities you give us. Help us see how we might encourage someone somewhere, because you always put us in places and situations to do so. We pray that we will not miss those opportunities. May we be forever faithful in following through when you prompt us. And we pray that these encounters will allow others to feel your rich love for them. This is our prayer. Amen.